everybody, John here and on to the garage today. We're doing a 10,000 mile test drive and review on a Jaguar XK8 convertible. As always, I'm going to give you a completely unbiased, warts and all, real experience version of a car review. I have to declare right up front um, a uh, vested interest. Obviously, all the vehicles I drive, I, I own or friends own or uh, I have some connection with. This one, I love. This car is the car I have owned the longest in my life. I've had this eight years. I'm very unlikely to ever sell it. No matter what goes wrong with it, this is my car. So, with that in mind, I genuinely will give you the, the overall impression. But, spoiler alert, I love this car. So, quick intro. Jaguar's XK8. This is the convertible version. It's a 1997 uh, they started production in 1996. This is a very early version. It's a Mark I. Um, identifiable from the outside quite easily because of the recessed fog lights. Mark II's had a flush fog light. Um, this car is an evolution of the platform used for the XJS. It's a big evolution. You can trace the heritage of some of the parts back to the XJS, but you're not gonna be swapping around components between the two vehicles. I've driven XJSs, love them, beautiful vehicles, but this is a different planet. Um, it's a more comfortable car. Um, the handling is much better. Generally, the XK8 feels a lot better screwed together, more refined. There's a lot of years of evolution gone into the vehicle, so you'd expect that anyway. It is the same platform as is used for the Aston Martin DB7. So again, if you're familiar with that vehicle, this vehicle, you could actually consider transferring components they are essentially the same car heavily customized and specced entirely differently Aston Martin's taking the straight six um, which is a beautiful beautiful engine which develops more power uh, and performance than this car but the supercharged version of this will trounce the Aston Martin to my eye, the Aston Martin DB7 has the edge on exterior styling. I can't make my own mind up if that's just the um, connection I'm making with the brand and the look. Uh, they're both very, very beautiful cars. Um, I think the Aston maybe just has the edge. Um, interior, this is better. In every regard to my eyes it looks better it looks like it's been put together with more thought um, the Aston smacks a little of kit car to me I'm sure that's going to offend a few Aston folk but uh, layout just doesn't feel right fit and finish I'm sure it was beautiful when brand new it's not maybe lasted quite so well and the driving position is not good, not good. Offset pedals, a uh, bit cramped. It, it just doesn't feel nice. This, it's like wearing a glove. So, eight years of ownership. I, I can't say it's high days and holidays as a car. Um, at the moment, I'm doing my regular commute of 320 miles each way. Um, from Lincolnshire down to Torquay so it does get used but it also gets polished and goes around the odd track day excursions down the coast for an ice cream 
it, it's my fun car really um, but it does get used it's not a toy 99% of the time it's got the top down tops up for you guys so you can hear me better I'd love to be able to say they've been completely trouble free eight years I can't um, these vehicles are actually very reliable as old Jags go this is where it started to come good um, but they do have a series of faults almost all of them are well known documented sorts of things that you can preemptively fix and change and occasionally my wallet has not been big enough to get me ahead of the game on those things. The car has never actually let me down as in stranded me anywhere, but we've had a few issues along the way. So, to the spec scores, an S is for safety. This is a 21 year old car, so safety standards are never going to be what uh, a modern car has. It's an inherent, inherently a good car, a very strong car. Um, it has modern features that were quite sophisticated in their day and are second nature to us all now. So there's a selection of airbags. They have pretensioner seat belts, ISO fix rear seat fitting, which I think quite amusing because the rear seats are so small but genuinely you can get a child seat in there fuel tank is mounted high and in the middle behind uh, the rear bulkhead so all good on a negative side it's an old car it's convertible it doesn't have a roll hoop it doesn't have any modern deployable um, rollover structure so it just relies on the strength in the windscreen frame if you do go over it's a 300 horsepower rear wheel drive car that's 21 years old so it can be a little bit of a handful in bad weather um, traction control and ABS are on it you can turn them off I've done that like twice you do need them um, if you explore the limits of traction you really enjoy the drive you can feel the back end squat and move sideways just a touch you get a little bit further enough to enable the traction control and it will catch you but it's violent so mixed bag good for an old convertible car and for that reason, we're going to give this a spec score of 5 for safety. Through the magic of YouTube, my shirt has now changed. Or, it's another day. This particular camera angle does make it look like I've got enormous hands. They're normal hands very strange angle the P in specs or the first one is for performance and whilst this isn't a out-and-out -out sports car it is a genuine GT um, and has a mighty engine so as you would expect on a performance front the Jaguar XK8 does rather well 
as is normal with my reviews we'll include a little window down acceleration on an on-ramp just so you can um, hear what it's like okay we're at 15 miles an hour just entering the on-ramp leave a little just bit of space and then go Believe it or not, folks, we're 60. And I had to back off for the traffic. Now we're at 40. And we're away again. That's 60. And let's just roll the window up. Okay, so now we're cruising at 70 miles an hour. We're doing uh, just under 2,000 RPM. I'm just gonna knock off the air conditioning for a minute. It's really hot today. 28, 29 degrees. Oops, that's a radio. Just so you can get a sense of uh, the sort of sound levels in here. I'm wearing a lapel mic. Disclaimer, my car is not completely standard. There's a shock. Um, mods to this motor include the exhaust system. And the exhaust system certainly does free up some extra performance. Hence declaring it now. I'll just insert a little clip now of the soundtrack from the outside of the car with a microphone on the number plate. Fabulous, right? Yeah. And when you are driv driving it like a hoon, like that, um, the performance is mighty. This car, when new, was allegedly able to do 0 to 60 in 6.4 seconds. And this is the slowest car in the XK8 range. Um, my car now does it in fractions under six maybe so I'm going to say about six seconds and the mods that are contributing to that include um, exhaust system which is uh, one I got supplied through Adamesh which is a well-known online uh, provider of Jaguar exhausts but the actual exhaust um, is available at other prices from other places and I'll put a link in uh, the description below to some examples of where, where you might go look for some of the parts of my exhaust system if you want more performance as standard first thing you do is go to a XKR rather than the 8 the R versions being supercharged and a supercharger takes you down to about five and a half seconds to 60 and stops quicker. So one of the negatives on this car as a performance motor is the brakes are completely adequate. They're fine. Like most big automatics, first time you touch the brakes, you nearly throw yourself at a windscreen. Whereas you get more and more familiar with the car and maybe push a little bit further um, you tend to come to the conclusion where it could have done with more brake. Um, braking from high speed, you do sometimes detect that they're warming up and not quite giving their all, and they don't have that bit of bite you, you'd just love to have. The XKRs do have that bite because they have a Brembo brake package. If you go for a later, a Mark II 
XK8, the ones with the flush fog lights at the front. Most, if not all, are 4.2 litre engines. It's the same engine, um, it's a larger capacity, but it does have a lot of uh, upgrades and mods to the ancillaries, which we'll cover maybe in the costs area which don't contribute an awful lot to the way that it drives but certainly help out on uh, some of the reliability issues and those later models even in non supercharged form are into the 5 seconds, 5.5 seconds uh, 0 to 60s later XKRs yeah, we're in supercar uh, territory so it's a fast car it will go up to 155 even when it's 21 years old and then hits a speed limiter they will go faster than that if you can be bothered to do anything about it but what's the point handling is a, a dividing thing um, as I said this is not a sports car it is a GT a Grand Tourer it's an incredibly capable fast car the grip is prodigious this has got a brand new set of Pirelli P0s on, which is the original intent for this car. And I do recommend, if you can afford to fit them, fit them, because they're brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And the grip levels are epic for a rear wheel drive car. But it's got a lot of weight at the front and a lot of power. You wouldn't throw the keys to this to your best friend's brother who quite enjoys a really quick hot hatch they will put it in a ditch it's a car to be respected in that regard it's not got foolproof handling and also it's softly sprung it's long springs it's uh, smoothly damped it does roll a little in the bends by sports car standards so can feel vague and light which is brilliant for doing long distance as I am um, if you want something that feels like you're riding on the back of a shovel and you're in contact with uh, the grain of the road this is not the car for you you could mod it to be the car for you there's lots of good stuff available but as standard these are really refined smooth floating cars that just happen to go around bends like they're on rails the steering very light still feel the road well and it certainly centers well if the tires start to wear or you get your tire your tire pressure slightly wrong they track really badly and that can make driving hard and quick uh, a little skittish one of the other performance mods that I've applied to this is to just change the panel filter for a K&N cotton gauze filter but I certainly don't think that the standard air induction system is bad but you can flow more air with um, aftermarket kits worth looking at um, and undoubtedly if you can flow more air ultimately you make more power more torque I'm not sure Another thing that marks this out as a GT rather than a sports car, the XK8 and the XKR are not available as manuals. The gearbox is actually really good. It's very smooth. Um, if you put it in sports mode, it holds the gears longer and has a more uh, aggressive change. Also lets the variable cam time in know to do its thing a little bit differently and as we mentioned it's got the J gate later Jaguars have moved away from the J gate and have got the rotary rising knob which is sexy and works beautifully uh, I've had two cars with that on but there's something quite nice about having this manual shifter on an automatic gearbox essentially what it enables you to do is drop it in drive and you've got a torque converter um, standard five-speed auto gearbox move it over to the left hand side of the J and you can put it into second gear manually 
and the car will select between first and second it won't allow you to manually select first in case you decide to try and blow the gearbox up you can manually select third you can manually select fourth and prevent fifth or you drop it back into um, the right hand side of the J gate and it's got all of its gears and using that you can actually hustle a thing along really well and down the lanes it is a faster more enjoyable experience to drive it using the J gate and I think quite a lot of Jaguar enthusiasts actually mourn the loss of the J gate much as we moved on to more sophisticated gearboxes so don't be put off as long as you've driven an automatic before jump into an XK8 give give it a chance don't dismiss it because it's an auto you can have a lot of fun with this box so the performance score out of 10 based on the power based on the torque based on the acceleration based on the sound um, this car should get a 9 at least uh, and only not a 10 because obviously there are faster cars out there I'm actually going to back it down to an 8 and the 8 is for the fact that brakes are part of your performance and unless you've got an R the brakes are not that great uh, they are adequate they're not a game changer they're just you would like more and as a performance machine the suspension lacks that little bit of uh, H something I might be doing something about on a future video so 8 out of 10 for performance practicality is the next P what's it like to live with what's the positives what's the negatives well let's let's start with the experience here you know I, I drive as you know a long way big commutes I'm on the return leg of my 320 mile commute now and it's 28 degrees outside and I'm in a 21 year old British sports car and it's a convertible and I'm fine. Uh, a, we're in a very comfortable place. We'll deal with it elsewhere. We're in a convertible that I believe has got one of the best soft tops you can you can buy. Um, I don't mean for its era either. I mean full stop. And this soft top is completely automated. There are no latches up here for me to operate there is nothing for me to do I press a button it folds up or down uh, it's hydraulically operated which is cool because it means it makes almost no noise um, and it seems 100% reliable so far touch some wood nothing about it flaps or moves it's even got gutters and the rear window's glass so having a convertible is not really a compromise in terms of the driving experience. Is the coupe going to be slightly quieter? I'm sure it is. Can I feel that this is, going, is noisy because of the roof? No, I can't. And I can take mine off. Um, interior space up the front, plenty. Um, it's not a massive cabin, but space up front for two is excellent. The um, glove box is a good size and is lockable. There's a cubby under the arm, uh, places to stick stuff. Tiny door pockets, which sort of double up as the door handles. It's a sort of styling thing. Um, what this car lacks, big styly, is a cup holder. I tend to uh, jam my tin between the passenger seat and the centre console. You can get a armrest that's modified to take um, the cup holders and the later models do have that but it, it shouldn't matter if it kind of does you know real world use my car doesn't have sat nav that doesn't particularly bother me I use my phone later models have uh, sat nav 
and you know we've got the electric seats and all the other bits and pieces so from an interior point of view quite practical quite usable no compromises boot very big very big by convertible sports car standards it's got a raise and lower floor like much modern car much more modern cars so you can took a lot of stuff away under there if you like um, it's got a space saver so you can run some distance on its right diameter um, but it's kind of pointless trying to put a spare wheel in this car as it runs different size wheels front and rear you would have the wrong one so that's pretty good there's no real issues there it does have rear seats you are not going to be carrying two adults in the two rear seats I have on occasion had an adult in the two back seats sideways and it's fine as long as you're friends and you're having a laugh and particularly fine with the roof off um, smaller folk we're gonna love it because it's an amazing car um, there is next to no leg room the leg room in the back between the scrub of the seat and the back of the chair is as wide as my fist um, so you've got very small legs it does have ISO fix back there if we, as we said so you can put kiddie seats in the coupe does have a little bit more space back there a practicality fault um, relates to the roof when you fold it away which is said single press of button brilliant folds up in a uh, recess behind the passenger seats the rear passenger seats uh, with the headlining up and that headlining flaps around and it can get dirty and all the rest of it and so you've got a tono and it's a beautiful tono a liveret matches the interior trim you pop it on and it covers up the deck of the car and it does look an absolute treat but you've got this automatic hood if you're going to drive any huge distances with the roof off or you're going to leave it parked with the roof off you're going to want to cover up that headlining you've got to be in and out doing that so that's a foible i very often drive it with the roof down and uncovered it's not an issue you just want to don't want to do seven hours um in sun and a bit of rain and road dirt and all the rest of it getting on your on your nice headlining what's going on what's going on you don't have to sing there's a radio too it's a very low car mobility you know don't kid yourself if you've got achy backs and legs and all the rest of it getting in and out can be a bit tiresome you practically shuffling over the sills and as with all two-door cars the doors are long because this is such a elegant car um, they're even longer you get this style through length uh, it is a longer car than you imagine um, it's not much different to the Jaguar saloons so um, you know a lot of nose a lot of tail relatively small cabin big long car so the ultimate test of practicality for a car of its genre good I'm using it for not everyday driving but I could and I very often do big miles in it as well as pop into the shops it's not an unusable car but ultimately compared to all vehicles it's only got two full-size seats and um, the access and other bits and pieces means that I've got to bring my beloved XK8 down to a four for practicality the E in specs is for economy so let's hand over to my other self in the other shirt on another day just to share with you uh, the economy figures because I've reached the end of my 320 mile um, commute and we're at the bottom of a big hill which is always nice for just here in the engine <laughs> um, but also when I get to the top of the hill I'll show you the trip computer 
um, so you can see for yourself what a reasonably well sorted XK8 can do if used normally. turn the engine off or any jiggery pokery so uh, right, so let's see so there's my mileage 314.4 my journey is actually a little longer than that but uh, I stopped for fuel not long after kicking off and I reset the counter then. And if I hit the end of the stalk, there you go. Average fuel consumption, 31.1. Not bad for a four litre V8 quad cam engine in a 21 year old car. Right, time for me to do some work. See you later. So, a four litre sports car that you can get 30 to the gallon out of, that ain't bad. That ain't bad at all. Um, but obviously the, the fuel is not the only element in the economy, the costs of uh, running the car. Other positives, the insurance is going to be surprisingly good. As long as you are a grown-up, like myself, uh, in the prime of your life, then you'll be able to get very reasonable insurance. Mainly because the car is now old. The car has a reduced value. And it is seen as a classic. So, at 21 years old... My four litre Jaguar costs me around a hundred and eighty pounds a year to ensure fully comp uh, for myself and my wife as name drivers. Consumables, namely uh, tyres and exhausts, are obviously not the cheapest elements. The tyres on this car are big, they're wide, they're asymmetric in terms of sizes, and as if you're putting the right tyres on, the speed rating and load ratings mean you're buying amongst the most expensive tyres out there. They've got to be able to take a heavy 150 plus mile an hour car. So I'm running Pirelli P0s, and I recently replaced all of these and that cost me a smidge under £800 in the UK. So be aware of that sort of price. You can definitely save money. You can get a full set of uh, tyres but still hit all the right specs for around the maybe £600. But that's about it. You do not want to be putting cheapy... Um, no brand tyres or wrongly rated tyres on a car with this much torque you're just asking for trouble exhaust system is big and heavy and Jaguar will charge you a fortune and there's a lot of it don't get me wrong you're paying for a lot of stuff but again advantages there's a lot of aftermarket kit available for the XK8 so on to the other negative parts of the cost, the economy of owning an XK8. If you're going to own one for more than a couple of years, you are going to have to change parts. They're all of an age where there's certain things going to go wrong with them, even if it's just perishables, the rubber items, etc. 
and some of the jobs can be a little expensive. It's all manageable, and if this is a hobby car, if this is a car that you've got because you like it, it's a car because you love it, it won't matter, it's not going to break the bank. If it's a car to drive, just transport for you, unlikely to be fair, but if it is, it's probably not a good deal for something you're going to own for two to five years. Um, so what are the negatives I've had? I've had one major bill with the car, and that was I had to have the automatic gearbox rebuilt. They're a sealed for life unit, you don't have to add oil, you don't have to change the oil. But the reality is, as the cars are getting older, um, that oil does need changing, it can be done, there isn't a filler. Um, certain components don't work well with the older oil, and there are some design flaws, some weaknesses in the earlier vehicles like mine. Mostly addressed in the 4.2 litre versions. I mean, a couple of the internal components in the gearbox can let go, and mine did. But even that didn't cause me to be stranded. The vehicle basically developed a slipping clutch. It wasn't a slipping clutch, it's uh, something slightly more serious. But such as the built in redundancy and the limp home modes, etc., I was able to do the rest of my journey, which was over 100 miles. Uh, without too much inconvenience, if I'm honest. The repair for an independent was £1,500. So, not inconsiderable. So, if you're going to look at a car that's around the 80, 90,000 mile range, you ought to factor in the potential for that. Or know that the gearbox has been changed, or for it's a later car. Um, the other big ones that people have, um, the timing chain tensioners is a well-known issue with early XK8s. Their design it incorporates a lot of plastic and they don't work that well. They can let go, they can cause catastrophic damage. It's actually quite rare for them to um, break a chain or jump a cog but the timing and tensioners and slippers do wear quite badly. So it's worth getting them changed. If you don't know they have been done, you should get them done. If you're getting an independent to do that, that could cost you maybe 500 pounds. If you're doing it yourself, in theory, you can do it for about 150 pounds. I changed my chains when the gear was taken out and the tensioners were swapped for the later model, again, the 4.2 engined cars uh, tensioners. Um, we could see there's a lot of wear on there. Nothing disastrous, nothing that was gonna cause imminent failure, but it just reinforces the legend that they don't really last forever. You've gotta look at changing them if it's an early car. And the final big one is what's called the Nickersill issue. The Nickersill issue is associated with the unusual design of this engine. This engine and one of the BMWs of the same era went down a route of having an entirely aluminium engine. It doesn't have any cylinder liners at all. So the pistons are running in an aluminium bore. And those bores are treated with a substance called Nickersill, nickel silicon and it's a, a coating, it's incredibly hard, very low friction and should last a lifetime of your vehicle. In the 90s, when these cars were new, fuel in the UK and in a few other countries actually had quite high levels of sulphur and that sulphur, under certain conditions, would attack the Nickersill lining and cause it to break down and effectively wear out the bores. Jaguar actually recognised this quite early and put in a regime of changing the whole engine under warranty, no quibble, if anybody drove a car in that had worn bores. 
So a huge quantity of XK8s of this period had their engines changed. And what they did was uh, a company that actually is a company I went and helped at the time put together a production line to take the original Jaguar engines, ball them out and insert a conventional steel liner. They were then fitted under warranty and away they went. And those engines are great and they're conventional and they're going to live as long as any conventional engine will live. Those engines that weren't affected by Nicosil because they weren't uh, being used for short journeys, they didn't do many miles, they didn't pick up too much um, crappy fuel, they went on, as has this one, to have no issues whatsoever. And so if your engine has been changed, that's fine. If your engine has not been changed and still has good compression, it's fine and there's nothing to worry about. And in fact, a Nicosil engine is a lighter engine, it has a lower internal friction, and it's original. So it's actually quite nice to have one of the ones that hasn't been changed. It won't give problems now because there isn't sulphur in the fuel. Other less disastrous um, issues that you can have, and I've dealt with all of these ones, and maybe put together a video on some of the specifics on each of those, how to fix. Um, front suspension, top wishbones can actually freeze up and corrode onto their pivot points, causing the suspension to go stiff and ultimately snap a wishbone. That happened to me. Some expense there. Uh, rear wheel bearings are not a job that you can do yourself unless you've got experience and a press. And even with experience and a press, when you see the task and the design of that rear hub, you're probably going to want somebody else to do it. So there's an expense there. That could cost you £100 a corner very easily. Um, the water pumps do tend to go. This is a car that made early use of plastics for intake manifolds, all sorts of structural bits under the bonnet. It used a plastic water pump impeller. That does break down over time. It's worth changing even if it isn't bust. And the same with the thermostat housing tower. All plastic, time gets the better of it. It's worth changing to an all alloy unit. But lots of bits of foibles that make the car a constant drain on your pocket. But there's a good network of people who know how to fix it. There's a good network of people providing parts. Nothing on this car is unobtainable. Um, until recently, body panels for the rear were very hard to get and you had to probably have them made by hand. They've just started to be able to get welding panels, so even that. And from a rust point of view, the cars do suffer with blisters on the rear wheel arches. Um, they can corrode the rear bumper mounts, which can cause the rear bumper to drop off. And the floor wells, uh, both driver and passenger side, can rot through because of a plate that's welded to the underside for assembly uh, that traps moisture. So you tend to get this very localised, perfectly square corrosion. But again, not that big a deal to get welded up. So for an older, relatively exotic British bruiser, the costs, they're not disastrous, but this is not a cheap car that you could use for shopping every day and expect to have no running costs. So, scores for what it is, an old British muscle car, a classic, one of the most beautiful cars on the road, in my opinion. Costs are not too bad, but it's not a cheap car. I'm going to have to give my favourite car only a four out of ten for economy. The C in specs is for comfort. Is it good news? 
This is a Jaguar. This is going to go well. It's a sporting car, but with fabulous suspension, long travel, well damped, very sophisticated rear end. If you've got a highly specced version or an XKR, you may have CATS suspension. And the CAT suspension is a package of adaptive dampers which react both to how you're driving, road speed, and the uh, road beneath you, and recognize when you want a sportier um, drive and firm up the damping considerably. But this is a standard car. I'm cruising along the motorway. 250 miles into my 350 mile drive home I'm still comfortable the seats are great these are standard seats they're called classic there was an option which was the sport seat which is just basically a slightly different design and stitching etc later cars have Recaro seats as do uh, XKRs and they have a separate headrest. They are more desirable. They are probably a little more comfortable. But these are great seats. They're a fabulous place to sit. Electrically adjustable. Move forwards, backwards, up, down. And the squab can be tilted up and down as well. And I have uh, inflatable lumbar support in the backrest. Some cars will have heated seats. Mine doesn't move on to the steering column got adjustable for reach and rake and it's a really big um, selection of movements there so you can get really comfortable in that regard um, again higher spec models options you can have uh, electrically adjustable reach rake on your steering wheel and that also incorporates a move away program so when you open the driver's door the steering wheel retracts and goes up which is really nice because it is a low car and everything that you can have to ease you out is a good thing the wheel itself is a work of art mahogany or walnut um, mine's a mahogany rim uh, leather clad and a hand stitched leather airbag with a Jaguar embossed middle it's all very luxurious. The centre console is hand stitched and is in genuine leather. Um, the dashboard is not real leather but a really high quality grained finish matches the door cappings. Um, we've got climate control which is very effective even on my 20 year old car it does lose a little bit of gas now and again but we can top that up, show you that another day. And we've got a in-car entertainment system which is high quality for the day. I've got a tape player and an FM AM radio. In the boot, there is a Jaguar Alpine um, CD player. This is an Alpine head unit as well, but branded Jaguar. It is not a standard DIN fitting um, stereo so if you pull it out the back is din but the face here isn't and if you want to replace that unit with something more sophisticated you need to buy a new face here for your dash but you can get that and again that's something I intend to share with you on uh, a later video it's beautifully carpeted as you'd expect from a Jaguar the headlining is really um, nice do notice a little bit of sagging and wrinkling on the windscreen pillars again a common issue and quite easily resolved the middle armrest is genuinely in the perfect spot it is a nice place to rest your arm and has a decent storage compartment inside it the um, cigarette lighter cum 12 volt outlet is inside the ashtray again ages this car somewhat between the armrest and the gear stick 
so that's not as convenient on the wires coming out in the middle there this is a car that my wife enjoys big journeys in you know we, we've had some very luxurious cars and she's finding this sports car to do epic journeys very comfortable very lovely place so it's not just a case of because it's a nice driver's car you put up with it it is genuinely a beautiful thing to sit in the dashboard for me is a work of art what we got is real wool not veneer it's actually veneer wrapped in the main onto aluminium pressings which is quite unusual um, you can get all sorts of different woods and effects for the XKR and the XK8 and it's something you can swap out at a later date if you don't like the look of it um, and the design is um, one of the XK8's little secrets and I've got a big list of these to share with you another day but I'll share this one now it's modelled on a Spitfire wing and the reasoning behind that is this car was built in the Castle Brom factory and Castle Brom Jaguar used to be Spitfire production line and uh, the island just outside the factory is known as Spitfire Island and has a beautiful beautiful um, monument to the Spitfire so this is a homage to where it came from and really suits the feel of the car is that the interior is Spitfire, it is gentleman's club, it is wooden leather, it is British. It's a very, very British feeling interior. And it's aged well. It's aged very well. The comfort and convenience associated with the roof is also top of the line luxury. You've got still got that huge, beautifully trimmed boot back there. It means you can cruise down to the south coast with your nice leather luggage um, rather than cramming things in plastic bags and it's fully automated there is no need to reach up here and work any clasps tinker around with anything so we're on the motorway in traffic at the moment and I'm gonna hit the button for the roof and you can see how quickly that moves so the rear windows quarter panels have just come down on their own you can't see those I don't think it's just undone its own latches and there he goes and he's folding back the roof for me tucking it into the bay behind the rear seats um, I've driven a lot of sporting cars and Porsche is an obvious uh, competitor for this vehicle but I've got to say of the era 911s are not as comfortable and they're not as plush we could argue that they are better screwed together you can always discuss what's aesthetically more pleasing but if we are talking comfort and luxury old jag has got it licked i feel it should lose some points for comfort because it's low and hard to access but that feels like I'm criticising it for being a sports car and likewise you're not going to be comfortable if you're in the back but that's criticising it for being a sports car I'm going to give this 9 out of 10 for comfort I'm going to sit comfortably here while some hydraulics put the roof back up. It's getting hot. Don't want the top of my head to burn, a bit bald. <sighs> and I'm just gonna turn off the air conditioning so we can enjoy the quiet. And that's how quiet my four litre V8 is without the air conditioning rumbling along on the motorway very slowly the last item in the spec score is S for soul and I think you know where this one's going guys so 
soul, as we described in our previous videos, the emotive content. Is it something that you love? Is it something you can be passionate about? I adore this car. I probably will never sell this car. It would actually make more sense because I love XK8 so much for me to buy another one and sell this one and buy a 4.2 which does have some more upgraded, rugged, uh, slightly more sophisticated parts on it which means it's kind of future proofed a little more. But I like this car and that soul, this has got a personality. This is PJ, this is my Jag and I think most people who have one of these for more than a few months and decide to actually use it and drive it get like that about them. Few people are defeated by, you know, you you have got to tinker, you have got to replace things. If you're not that way inclined or you can't afford it, then yeah, I get that. You're going to fall out of love with it. If it's a car that you can use as a second car and you enjoy going to the garage and playing with it and tinkering with it, this is a dream car. It sounds not like anything else. Yes, it's a V8, but it's got a crackle and a crisp note to it. That sort of means it's it's got a bit of, I don't know, Saab two-stroke screaming away, connected with a V8. Odd. It's, you know... Shut up, sat well, that woman. I'm exuding positivity. Oh. Um, yeah, you know what it is when you hear it coming. You're, you're left in no doubt that that's a Jaguar V8. How fabulous. I love the way it looks. Um, from almost every angle, it is achingly beautiful. I'm looking down the bonnet and I'm reminded of probably Jaguar's high point, the E-Type long bonnet raised over the wings and a very specifically it's copied off a Jaguar raised bonnet centre it's the same shape running all the way down to the nose beautiful that oval grille the single bar slat the really big powerful lines over the rear haunches amazing I'd even say that I prefer the look of the steel-bodied X100, this car, to the aluminium later XKs. Um, because this has got a smoother, purer look to it. And also the headlights are somehow wrong on the XKs. Now, it's going to be XK lovers hating me saying that. That's fine. <laughs> what you prefer. I prefer this, you prefer that one. Something slightly Hyundai about the headlights, where the rest of the car is macho and British. Don't know, it's just something. Take a stare at it, see if you can see where I'm on about. Maybe I'm completely wrong. So, I think in terms of soul, this is the one. Controversially, this scores 10. For soul. So that's a spec score of 39 out of 60 for the XK8. If you've enjoyed this video and want to see more great stuff, then please subscribe to To The Garage. Remember, it's always free on YouTube.